know, I wanted to start today's message by just thanking you all so much. Because, you know, we're calling this year a year of becoming, where we're aware of God's invitation to each one of us to move from where we are to the people he wants us to become. And the beginning of this year so far has been so extraordinary to see so many of you coming out on Tuesdays and Wednesdays and Thursdays, midweek, joining groups. I'm so blessed to be a part of what God is doing in our midst. And I'm so excited because I realize that it's, you know, in all of our lives, I mean, if, if, if you go to a, a gym, you know, uh, in January, the gym is, is totally filled with people, right? And then by like the third week in January, it's back to what it used to be. Or my son Obadiah works at a pizza place, and the first two weeks of the year, like, they have no orders because everyone has their New Year's resolutions. <laughs> and, and he came back from work yesterday. He's like, man, it is packed with people, <laughs> you know? And so I realize everyone starts off like, yeah, and then, and then they kind of settle in. But just to see over the last number of weeks, so many of you jump on into men's and women's and the care ministries and celebrate recovery. I just want to encourage you. I'm so excited, not only for the fruit that God wants to bear in your life as you're part of your family of faith and you're in a group, but I'm also so excited for how those times, not only the fruit will bear in your life, but it will bear in your family, and your friend group, on your job, you know, as you and I are in this process of growing and becoming more and more like Jesus. And so I can't get away, like literally I feel like in this season we are seeing the fruit of things we've been praying about for years to see, because sometimes, I'll be honest, in, in a large church, sometimes it's like, well, you know, you can go to a large church and it's, you know, the worship is great and the teaching is, is, is good, you know, but it's like, it's kind of low on relationships and real life on life growth. And, and we just made a commitment as a church that we're high up or low down. We want everyone to be in a group. We, we want people to, to be discipled and to grow together and let that iron sharpening iron and to see you all stepping into that and embracing that and saying, hey, I want to grow. This makes me so, like, I'm, I'm, I'm so honored to be able to be a part of this with you all. And so if you've been going, keep going. And if you haven't stepped in yet, listen, come and join us. There's open seats for you. But watching young adults and all these different ministries just blossoming, students on Wednesday night, or we also have students at 11 o'clock on Sunday mornings for those of you who have middle schoolers and high schoolers, just watching people connected and, and grow together. And I'm hearing such incredible tales of what God is doing in this season. And so thank you for so much for being a part of that. Now with that, in this year of becoming, we have to realize that if there's one thing that is consistent in life, and that is change. I know we don't always like change, right? That there's an old saying that uh, change is inevitable, but growth is optional. Because change is gonna happen, but are we really growing? And in this year of becoming, we're so aware of like, hey, change is gonna happen, but I really wanna grow. I wanna grow into be conformity to Jesus. I wanna become more like Jesus. I wanna be able to move forward in my life. But what you have to also realize is that our world is in constant change as well. And part of this idea of the year of becoming, it, I told you earlier in the year that it makes total sense that we do the end of the book of Revelation as the beginning of the year of becoming because what we realize is the world as it exists right now is not the way God intended it. And so things in the world have to change and they are changing. And what we end up with when we start talking about change in the world, and it's one of the things I don't enjoy about the day and age in which we live, is the way our world exists, especially in the West, it's almost always defined by American politics, which is proof positive that we're in trouble. Because really, the way we need to approach the becoming that God has for the world is from our Bibles outward, not from political parties inward. And so we all have our politics. I always tell you, everyone holds their political views personally, passionately. I just ask that you hold them under the authority of Jesus if you're a Christian. 
that you let Jesus inform your politics. And there's really no more powerful look at what God wants to do in the world than God taking everything that's wrong and making it right again at the end of the book of Revelation, right? And so it is so important for us to realize that all that's happening right now is temporary. And God is looking to do a work of restoration, a work of renewal, and God wants to change things. And really as believers, we get to be at our best, empowered by the Spirit to be a trailer for the coming feature presentation. How many of you guys know what a trailer is? Not, not so, uh, your double Y that you sleep in when you get in bed fight with your wife. That's not what I'm talking about. A trailer, it's like you, you see a snippet of a movie before you actually see the movie, right? And so normally a, a good trailer for a movie, you should be like, ooh, I want to see that. Like for like eight years, we, were, we couldn't wait for the new Top Gun movie because they were showing us the trailer for like 17 years. You know, Tom Cruise looks exactly the same all 17 years, but then all of a sudden it comes out and we're like, whoa. And sometimes, you know, you get a trailer and all the best parts are in the trailer. You're like, oh, that was kind of a bummer, right? But, but really, the people of God are meant to be a foretaste, a forerunner into the world of this is what God is up to. This is what God is working, right? And in a lot of ways, what we're gonna see today in the book of Revelation is we're gonna see God buttoning up all the worst parts of the world in which we live today. So you want to see it, don't you? Revelation 20. Open up your Bibles to Revelation chapter 20. Thank you for bringing your Bible to church with you. If you didn't, don't worry. We got your back because we got Bibles on the seats in front of you. Or, of course, if you got a, as I keep joking, your phone is only smart if it has a Bible on it. It might have some data on your phone, but that's not smart unless it's got God's word on it. So whether you read with your phone, you read with your a Bible, our Bible, your Bible, just open up to Revelation chapter 20. Now, before I jump in here today, oh, it's so good. I, I love the fact that our, uh, our great tech team, they didn't give me a timer, which means I'm going to go all day. No, I'm just kidding. It's actually up there. Everyone, was, everyone got nervous. They're like, no, Pastor Daniel. <laughs> <laughs> the timer's actually back there, so I know how long I got. But here's what I want to tell you before we jump into Revelation 20. This book, the book of Revelation, and this chapter of the book of Revelation, Revelation 20, is fraught with interpretive issues, right? So if you ever studied the book of Revelation, there's so much interpretation uh, arguments among scholars. So one of the things I'm don't want to do is tell you my preferred interpretation and tell you that only people who believe like me are deeply biblical. That's what pastors do to make you think that they're smarter than everybody else. But Jesus is Jesus, and it's the revelation of who? Jesus. So we want to see Jesus in the midst of this, and we here at Crosses, we make space for people who interpret it differently than us, and really, I just want to give you, like, here's the spread of interpretation, and every once in a while, I'll say, look, if you held me down and tickled me and made me choose a side, this is where I land, but really, don't hold me down and don't tickle me, unless you're going to give me a Twinkie, and that's a different discussion, <laughs> <laughs> but, but the idea here is we really want to see the book not as a... I need to understand exactly how this is all going to play out in the end so that I feel safe about the future. You should feel safe about your future because Jesus died and rose again. And, and in him, you are secure. Everything else is it could be this and it could be that. And Revelation 20 is full of this. And I'm going to try and unpack that for you. So if you remember at the end of Revelation chapter 19, we see Jesus coming back, right? And really... You know, as Jesus comes back, he's got all of a multitude of, of, of people in fine linen on white horses coming back, you know. And when that happens, you have the Antichrist and the false prophet. They are all, they're grabbed and they're thrown into, uh, into the bottomless pit. And really, they summon all the birds of the air like, man, it's going to be a great feast. There's a, this big final battle and, and Jesus is winning. And so look at what happens. Revelation 20, verse 1, it says, Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand, and he laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him so that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. But after these things, he must be released for a little while." 
So what do we learn here? We learn that at the return of Jesus, Satan is bound, right? Satan is bound. Now, there's a lot that we can talk about here, and there is a lot happening here. But what you have to realize, first and foremost, we have a tendency, if we don't really think biblically, to think that almost like, you know, Satan is God's evil alter ego. Like, God is Austin Powers, and Satan is like Dr. Evil, if you know the reference. Some of you know the reference, you sinners. No, I'm just kidding. Just means you're around in the 90s when that stuff was coming out, right? But what you have to realize here is Satan being bound, God doesn't leave his throne to do it. He actually sends an angel. Now, that's an important piece of information for us to see because we have to realize that the good versus evil battle that we see always at play in life, good wipes out evil without any issue. Does that make sense? So it's not like, it's like, it, it's like you know, if you like boxing, I, me- I remember growing up, you know, I grew up as a child of the 80s, so, you know, uh, Iron Mike Tyson, before he was a cultural icon, he was just a great boxer. And I remember watching him just like, you know, beat guys in like 30 seconds. You know what I mean? Like, it was just, it was unbelievable to watch. But then I remember I would watch it with my grandfather and my dad, because we like sports, and they would talk about like the earlier boxing bouts, bouts where these boxers would go in the middle of the ring and they just go toe to toe for like 10 rounds. You know, and in a lot of ways, the defeat of evil by God is more of a Mike Tyson fight than an old school knockdown, drag out, 12 rounds goes to, you know, to the card to find out who wins the match, right? And ain't, God doesn't leave the throne. He sends an angel. The angel grabs Satan and he throws him into the bottomless pit for a thousand years. So what you, what you have to realize is that the defeat of evil by God is not a challenge for God. It happens effortlessly. He sends someone else to do the dirty work for it. Now, what is interesting about this, of course, is if you were with us in, in our message on Revelation 19, we focused in on the four names of Jesus. Do you remember that? Where we saw Jesus is called faithful and true. He's called the word of God. He's called the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And he's got a, a name that nobody knows except him. And we made the point, like, we're gonna see Jesus. What's interesting is in the binding of Satan, we get four names for Satan as well. Right? He's called the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan. So we, we learn a little bit about our adversary. One, he's called, of course, the dragon, and he's been called that all the way through uh, the book of Revelation, things like Revelation chapter 12, different places. 27 times in the Old Testament, the word shows up. And so uh, he's called the serpent of old, which links the devil and Satan to that serpent in the Garden of Eden in Genesis chapter 3 who deceived Adam and Eve to disobey God by eating of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Of course, he's called the devil, you know, which literally means the slanderer or the accuser. Or, and then, of course, he's called uh, Satan, which means the adversary. Now, I think what's interesting with all the names, I want you to notice what it says here. Verse 2, he laid hold of the dragon that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years and cast him in the bottomless pit and shut him up and put a seal on him. Now listen to this, verse three. So that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. So what we learn here is that Satan, the devil, the serpent of old, the dragon, he's got one goal and that goal is deception. Now, if you go into your, your favorite browser window, you grab an old school Webster's Dictionary, you go to the library and you rock the Dewey Decimal System and you look up the word deception, what you find is deception is any act, whether big or small, seeking to subvert people from believing what is the truth, to buy into something that isn't the truth for their own advantage. Now, what is fascinating about this is that this is what the devil's role and job always is, is to bring deception. Which, if you look at our culture and our world today, is on full display because we live in a what is truth culture. Everybody says, well, I have my truth. And you really can't put a personal pronoun in front of the word truth. If it's your truth, it's actually your opinion. That's how it works. But we live in a world where it's like no one is entitled to say this is the truth, except Jesus said, I am the way, the and the life. And no one comes to the Father but by him. So in our culture, we have a truth problem. 
But we really don't have a truth problem. We just have a comprehension problem. Right? So what Satan's job always is in all of our lives is to deceive us so that we don't believe the truth. Right? And he does it for his own advantage. Like if someone is deceptive with money, they will lie to you to make you believe something wrong so that they can advantage themselves. Right? So it's to a personal advantage. And really what you find with Satan is that there's an old saying that misery loves company. And, and Satan's miserable and he wants the glory. And he knows that if you don't give God the glory, then he thinks he gets the glory. That's his goal. So deception is real. Now here's the thing. It's really easy to sit in church, to stand in church, to preach in church, and say, listen, the world is deceived, but I'm here to tell you, deception is at play in all of our hearts and in all of our lives on some level. And growth in Christ, growing in our faith in Jesus, is a perpetual bring our lives into the light and saying, Lord, where am I believing a lie? Where has deception taken root in my heart and in my mind, in my life. Because if you, what you believe, you end up acting out. Does that make sense? Like it begins with a belief and that belief leads to an action. So at the level of what we believe, when deception is at play, then Satan can have fun. And it says that Satan deceived all the nations and he does, and he tries, seeks to deceive all the people. The serpent deceived Adam and Eve by his craftiness. It's always the same thing. So for each one of us, things like reading the Bible and being a part of church, being in a group, praying, worshiping, these are all opportunities to bring our lives in the light so we can see what are the lies that I believe? Now, here's what I want to tell you. Don't think for one second that you don't believe any lies. Because we all do. We're all growing. Sometimes we have the right belief, but the wrong application of that belief. Right? Sometimes we have the wrong belief, but we apply it in a way that actually makes it look good. Right? Like, so like, for all of us, life is constantly about being like, what are the deceptions that I've bought into? And how do I repent of those, which turns from the deception and turns to God so that I can grow? And I'm here to tell you, no matter how long you walk with Jesus, there are a lot of these. Kind of like it's, it's like peeling an onion away where there's always, oh, I, I can't believe I used to believe that. I can't believe I used to do that. And if you feel that way, that means you're growing. You're not what you used to be. You're not what you're going to be. But the key for each one of us is to be on that journey saying, I want to believe no lies. My bride, Lynn, we were just talking about this recently. It was so cool. We were talking about something. She's like, well, we always have to make sure we discern what is truth and what is falsehood in the midst of this. And I'm like, ooh, so good. That fits right in my sermon. Thank you very much. I'll preach that one, you know? But for you, for me, for us, we need to say, where is deception at work in my life? Now, you can always find where the deception at work in your life when the way you're holding whatever you believe does not have the fruit of the Spirit at work in it. So if what you believe does not make you more loving, more peaceful, more joyful, more patient, <laughs> more gentle, more kind, more self-controlled. That's how you know. You're like, oh, there, there's some deception there, right? And Satan's job is to deceive. But he's gonna be bound so that that deception ends, right? Now, it's important to remember because, you know, um, we don't wanna have kind of a satanic obsession in our lives. Sometimes you can go in church and they're like, it's all like, it's, everything's like, a, like an obsession with Satan. You have to remember 1 John 4, 4 says this, you are of God, little children, and you have overcome them because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. And that's cool, isn't it? It's a good reminder. He who's in you is greater than he who's in the world. So, so the, the power of God is greater than the power of the enemy. But we're not ignorant of his devices. So we have to ask the Lord to help us root out the deception. Now, you notice what's going on here. It says he's bound, right? And he's going to be shut up for, that he won't deceive 
for a thousand years until the thousand years were finished. But then after these things, he must be released for a little while. Now, this is where things get weird. I'm gonna keep reading for you. It says, verse four, and I saw thrones and they sat on them and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God who had been worshiped who had worshiped the beast, who had not worshiped the beast or his image and had not received the mark on their foreheads or on their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years, but the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. So what we see here is that really we're encouraged here to enjoy the first resurrection. Because I get that right from verse six. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Right? So you should, we want to enjoy the first resurrection. But really this whole section and, and really the binding of Satan is really so that there could be this thousand year period. Now, when you hear the word thousand and years, what do you think of? The millennium, not the millennials, the millennium, right? Now, if you want a really controversial topic among biblical scholars, bring up the millennium, and then you will find everybody draws their battle lines. There are three primary positions on how people deal with the millennial reign of Jesus, this thousand year period, and uh, they can't agree on almost anything. It's a beautiful thing. One's called premillennial, one's called postmillennial, and one's called amillennial. Now, notice they all have the word millennial in it, right? Because it's all about this thousand year period. So it's all about the prefix. Everybody remember English comp? Right. So pre means what? You guys are so smart. You must go to a great church with a great pastor. No, I'm just kidding. So premillennial means Jesus comes back before the thousand year reigns. Postmillennial means what? He comes back after the reign, uh, after the thousand year reign. And then amillennial means what? No millennia. The word a means no in Greek or Latin. So like agnostic is a no knowledge, gnosis is knowledge. Atheist, a no theist God. So the word a means no before. So then, so there are people who believe that Jesus comes back before the millennium. Some people believe he comes back after the millennium. And then some people are like, oh, hell, there actually is no millennium. Now here's what I want to tell you. People love Jesus, they love his word, they take it really seriously, and they hold all these positions. Now, those are just the three, like, the three bases, so to speak, but then there are all sorts of people on different places in between all the bases. And then there's some people who don't want to run the bases at all. That's a different discussion. So what we have here, and, and if you've been with us in the series, and I'm going to nerd out for a second, so if, if, I, if I shoot over your head, just kind of hang with me, and I'll come back to, to normal land. But depending on how you choose to interpret the book of Revelation gives you certain parameters by which you interpret the book of Revelation. So what's interesting is for people who hold the book of Revelation, that everything is absolutely literal and futuristic. So everything, it's, it's hyper-literal, and it, this is going to happen in the future, then you land it pre-millennial because it says in Revelation 19, Jesus comes back, and then he establishes the millennial reign. Okay. If you believe in a more symbolic interpretation, right? Then you end up with the post-millennial position because you're like, well, listen, Jesus is reigning through the church now. He's here in the spirit now and Satan is actually subdued now. So if you have a symbolic interpretation, then you end up with kind of a more post-millennial. And then the amillennial position is very interesting because really what they're saying is the phrase thousand years in the Bible doesn't mean a literal thousand years because 1,000 years is just a really long time. Like it says in the scriptures that a day is as what? 1,000 years. It says that God owns cattle on 1,000 hills. Do you mean he doesn't own it on 1,001 hills? Does he own, oh, he only, does he, maybe he owns cattle on 999 hills. So it's, a, it's, it's, it's an even number that is emblematic or symbolic of a long time. And if anyone if I said, look, you're going to live a thousand years, you'd be like, whoa, that's a long time, right? And, you know, some of you, how many of you are like, some people, I always love this with people because I have this in my family all the time where some people round up and some people are like, like they're like, what time is it? I'm like, it's 10 o'clock. They're like, it's 9.56. <laughs> and I'm like, you're right. 
but that's 10 o'clock in my book. Like, that's close enough. But some, some people in my family be like, no, 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 it's 9.56, okay, you know? And so the idea here is depending on where you come from, you have these different interpretations. And to be honest with you, I think it's all gonna pan out. Okay, like, like it's all gonna pan out. But what you find here is in the scriptures, in the scriptures, what you find is that the reason God's good world doesn't work quite right is because of the presence of Satan and his deception. And in order for things to work the way God intended it, Satan needs to be bound and removed so that this thing can work the way it's supposed to work. And that's really what we're getting at here, that with Satan being bound, like, you know, everything is together. And, and now you have this, this resurrection. Now, what's interesting in verse four, the, the resurrection is really focusing on those who were martyred during that tribulation period when the Antichrist is at work and the mark of the beast and all this, right? And, and, and so it's almost like you have like a, a, a tearing of the resurrection. Now, I, now, listen, I said that out loud and I don't want you to overstate what I'm trying to say because who was the first fruits of the resurrection? Jesus, right? And then you have, remember when Jesus walked out of the tomb, then some people were resurrected in Jerusalem. You, it's a crazy verse in, in, in Matthew's gospel. And then you have like the hope of the future resurrection. And, the, and, and so what I'm saying is that some of our beliefs about like, well, I, I die and then I go to heaven with Jesus, it's like, well, it's a little bit more complicated than that. And if the millennial isn't uh, symbolic, then actually some of people are gonna go to heaven and they come back with Jesus on their white horse behind you and then they're gonna live on earth for a thousand years. So it's like you, you die and you go to heaven with Jesus, then you come back, you hang out on earth for a while and then heaven and earth is gonna pass away and you get a new heaven and a new earth and that's where you live forever. So to say like, I just, I wanna believe in Jesus so I go to heaven when I die, it's like actually, well, there's a new heaven and a new earth, you might come back and who knows how this is all gonna work. Well, did I just confuse everybody? Everyone's just looking at me like, what is going on right now? But if you take your Bible seriously, what I want to tell you is that it's not as simplistic as we want it to be. So many times you're like, man, I just want to go to heaven when I die. And I, I, there's that part of me as like your little brother in Christ who likes to start trouble and, 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 and create a little havoc. I'm like, well, actually you're going to go to heaven, but then you're going to come back to earth. And then you're going to go to a new heaven and a new earth. So don't get too comfy in heaven, you know? But the, the idea of heaven is when you die, you get to go be with Jesus where he is. Now, locations and timelines, that's a different discussion that is fraught with interpretive problems. But really what we find here is that the future for us holds being with Jesus where he is, where he reigns, without any evil or deception at work. And my friends, that's enjoying the first resurrection. <laughs> Like, that's what this is all about. I love this. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such, the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Now, of course, you're like, what's the second death, Musco? We're gonna get to that in a second. So hold your horses. But don't miss the fact that when you enjoy the first resurrection, you get to be priests with Jesus, which is what we're called to, 1 Peter chapter 2. And we get to reign with Jesus. Really, he reigns, but because he is the king of kings and we are his people, we get to be with him in that. And really what we learn here is that the benefit, one of the many benefits of being a follower of Jesus is we get to join Jesus in the work that he is doing. He is the priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek, as the writer to the Hebrews says, and he invites us to be priests with him. The Old Testament priest stood before God in the name of the people and stood before the people in the name of God. And all of us, when we are sealed and empowered by the Holy Spirit, that's our job. The reason you know the people you know, the reason you work at the places that you work, the reason we live in this community or whatever community you live in is so that you can be, have that priestly function where you stand before God interceding for the needs of your community and then you stand before the people in the name of God saying, hey, listen, God loves you. God is for you. God wants to do a work in your life. Listen, you don't have to stay there where you are. 
You don't have to be there forever. Yes, you are there now, but God is not going to leave you there. If you give yourself to Jesus right now, God is going to draw you and lead you in different directions. That's what the priest did. And that is who we are in Christ. And because Jesus reigns, we get to reign with him. But don't ever forget, my friends, that our God is a God of resurrection. I don't get it. I don't even like it. Because in order for something to be resurrected, there needs to be a dying first. And could be honest, like, death sucks. Like, it's lousy. But our God is a God who brings new life out of death. And sometimes that death is like the loss of a physical life, which is hard. So hard. Something, you know, many of us know a lot about. And it's heartbreaking. But other times, it's, you know, we have to die to ourselves. We were singing about it earlier, right? It's like the, the death of pride, the death of an, a false identity, a, a way of seeing ourselves. Sometimes in order for God to do what he wants to do, dreams that we've had need to die because there are dreams and not God's dreams. And when that happens, it hurts. But it hurts only as long as we forget that our God is a God of resurrection. The disciples on the road to Emmaus were dismayed because Jesus had died. And they hadn't yet become aware that he was resurrected. He was standing right in front of them. And when Jesus broke that bread as they ate dinner and their eyes were open and Jesus vanished. You can imagine how they walked on the road to Emmaus where they were going and how fast they ran back to Jerusalem. Back, no way! Like, we hung out with Jesus and we didn't even know it! You know, you can imagine they were so sad. They were, you know, they had the sad music, the minor chord music. They're just walking. Oh, you're the only one who doesn't know him. And we had home with so much hope in Jesus of Nazareth and now he's dead. And you can just imagine them rolling back like, yeah! Like, like, he's alive. And for each one of us, we have to remember our God is a God of resurrection. When, I, when, when the brokenness of the world and, the, and all of the dying that is happening, when it gets me down, I have to remember that my God is a God of resurrection. And of course, the Apostle Paul, Romans chapter 8, verse 11, but if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. My friends, if you're here today and you are born again, you've put your faith and trust in Jesus, the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is in you. And he will raise us up on that last day. And that is great joy and great hope. Now, verse 10. I could talk about so much stuff and all this. It's amazing. All the things that I don't tell you guys is really what freaks me out. <laughs> Verse 7. It says, Now, when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, whose number is as the sand of the sea. They went up on the breath of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. So what we learn here is that there's one final rebellion is crushed at the end. So you see what's going on here. Jesus comes back and the Satan is bound for a thousand years. He's placed in the lake of fire. Right? But then after the thousand years, he's released and he like one final rebellion. Right? That's what we're learning here. And, and, and everyone's about to say, well, who in their right minds would be a part of that? And that's a great question. But we should be asked that question for today and not for what happens after the thousand year reign of Christ, if that's a literal thing, which I think it is, but that's a different discussion. Right? It's like, it's like, why would someone not want to follow Jesus? And that's always the question. But you have to realize that there are people who are enter the millennial reign of Jesus, if that's a literal thing, which I think it is, but I'll say if, for those of you who don't, I'm fine. I'm no, we're not gonna fight about it. 
We'll all be there anyway. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> if we're in Christ, we're going to be there. It's going to be crazy. But, but what's interesting about it is there's going to be people who move into the millennium who were alive in that last generation who weren't at the Battle of Armageddon, but they don't actually believe in Jesus. So when Satan comes and he brings deception, people are going to, get, people are going to fall for that. Now, the other big question is, is why would God do it this way? And the answer is, is I don't know. I'm not God. I'm just telling you what it says. But what you have is Satan is released and there's one final rebellion. Now, what's interesting, if we take the millennial reign of Christ literally, there's all of these passages in the scripture about Jesus as the great king who rules in righteousness. And people say, well, that actually happens in the millennial kingdom in its fullness, like where the lion will lie down with the lamb, a child will be able to play in the serpent's hole. Like lions and lambs don't lie down together. One feasts and the other one's gone. You know, you don't let your kids play in viper holes because they get bit and you love your kids. And even if you don't love them in that moment, you still want them to get bit by a snake. So, so you protect them. But in the millennial kingdom, there won't be all the, the death and the violence and all the things that are going on. And so people say, well, that's gonna happen when Jesus returns and he sets up his kingdom on the earth. That's how that works. But what you have here is God allows this final rebellion after the thousand years and Satan is released. And what's interesting is, is he goes and he gathers together all, all of these, you know, f- d- 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 to deceive the nation. He'll go out and deceive the nations, which are at the four corners of the earth. And he calls them Gog and Magog, which is, if you don't know your Bible and especially the prophets, you're like, what is that all about? So just write down in your, in your margin, Ezekiel 38 and 39. It tells us battle of Gog and Magog. A lot of people, you know, there are uh, people from the north of Israel. People would consider it the stand region today. That would be that area. And what's interesting, if you've studied biblical prophecy or if you study people who are really into like all the things, then you've heard all about Gog and Magog and, and what's going on in Russia right now. And they've been talking about this since the, since the Cold War in America about how Russia's Gog and Magog. And it's like, hold on, it's, it says actually this all happens after. So don't miss that. Like if you, put, if, you, if you impose the timing on it, it's actually after the millennial reign when it happens. But we'll leave that there for people to get mad at me and send me emails that I won't read. <laughs> but I just say this stuff for fun because I can. <laughs> I just said that out loud. That was my inside voice. <laughs> Save your carpal tunnel to, to send love notes to your sweeties. Anyway. <laughs> But really what's going on here is there's this one final battle that's going to go on, but this battle, again, is going to be defeated quite effortlessly. (laughs) You know, it says, they come from the breadth of the earth, they go to surround the camp of the saints in the beloved city, and it says, and fire comes down from God out from heaven and devours them. So once again, it's not like a a tough fight. It's not like a fight to the the final buzzer. It's like evil is destroyed. It's crushed. God is so much more powerful. And then what we find here is that the devil, he had been placed into the, you know, uh, you know, into the bottomless pit, but now he's, because he's out, now they take him to the lake of fire, um, which is with brimstone, and he's put in there and he's, and he's judged forever. And that's where the antichrist and the false prophet are. So there, this is like the, the, the final destruction. And it's a great reminder. I said this earlier, but uh, John chapter 16, verse 33 says, these things I have spoken to you that in me, you may have peace. In the world, you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. And it's just a great reminder. Like there's issues in life, but in Jesus, we have peace. And if you find yourself, your soul is disquieted within you as the psalmist speaks of, what we have to do is we have to learn how to run into Jesus who is our peace. And we have to dwell there. And I'll be honest with you, the older I get, the more I need to find myself dwelling in Jesus. The more I'm aware of, it's very easy to to lose peace in this world. There's so many good reasons to. You know, on any given day, there's a million things to be concerned about and worried about. Things do not work the way that they, they should. People are not always altruistic or even kind. People have malicious intent, deceitful intent. That's all real. But Jesus is, because he's the Prince of Peace, he is our peace. And the righteous, those who have been saved by Jesus can flee into him and be safe. And so if you find yourself disquieted within you, Jesus is saying, you know, come to me. Let me do that work. Let me be your peace. Look what happens in verse 11. It says, then I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away and there was found no place for them. 
And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them, and they were judged each according to his work. Verse 14, then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire, which is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Really what we have here is what is commonly called the great white throne judgment. And the only way to really apply this is, my friends, Jesus is the key. Because the key to the first resurrection, the key to escaping the second death is Jesus. Because what we find here is that once that final rebellion is destroyed, then we have this great white throne and the Father sits on it. And it literally says that in the presence of God, heaven and earth flee away. That there's no place found for heaven and earth. Now, I can't even fathom that. Like, like I'm not a scientist in any way, but I can't even fathom how that all works. But we're gonna see in the next chapter that God brings in a new heaven and a new earth. So at this point, the heaven and earth as we experience it as it exists will be gone. And really what goes on is there's a series of books that are opened. I believe that the first set of books, if I'm going to press it, is the books, it's like almost like the log of your life, right? And then there's another book that's called the book of life. And everyone is judged according to their works. But if your name is written in the book of life, then you take part in the new heaven and the new earth as simple as it gets. Now, here's what you have to realize. And, and again, sometimes people are like, oh, you know, I don't like the Bible because the Bible's full of scare tactics. I'm like, it's not scare tactics. It's like everything you've ever done, the true and living God knows. It's like all, you, you could clear out your browser history as many times as you want. God knows where you've been. And so does Google. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like everyone knows. It's what it is. You can pretend you can buy things in cash. Nobody knows what you're doing. Yes, the, the, the true and living God knows because in him you live and move and have your being. Everything is known. And there's nothing we do in secret. So I, I remember there was an old uh, Sunday school story. The kid's like, I don't understand. Like, you know, why would God know, want to know it? Why is he always watching me? I mean, it's freaking me out. Sunday school teacher was so wise. He said, well, because God loves you so much, he can't take his eyes off you. Ooh, that's a change of perspective. And a wise Sunday school teacher, that's, they're writing kids, crossroads kids, I tell you. But here's the deal. God knows. And we're all weighed according to what we've done. And I'm here to tell you, all of us are weighed in the balances and found wanting. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There is not one of us, when those books are open and everything Fusco ever did, and you insert your name, everything we ever did is in there, and none of us stand. All of us deserve the lake of fire burning with brimstone. But then Jesus came on a rescue mission, knowing that all of us, we are all lost under the weight of our mistakes and our rebellion and our failings and our ignorances and all the things that we've done wrong. And Jesus says, I am going to die on a cross in your place. And whoever puts their faith and trust in me, although you deserve eternal damnation and judgment, you will be saved. And not only just make it into the, to eternity, but you will be called beloved on this side of eternity. And I will set my seal upon you and I will call you my child and I will lead you and I will teach you and you will grow and you will have grace upon grace and you will move from glory to glory. And that's why Jesus is the key here. Because, listen, I guarantee, I always say this, if all of a sudden, like, the, like the teletape readout of your life, like, the, it's like, you know, you, your profile picture, and then, like, the story starts, and I know what happens, you leave, right? Like, like I'm out of here, I don't want to see this. I was there, I didn't even want to see it when I was there. I realized if mine was up there, I shouldn't be anyone's pastor. God knows. I have no business. But if all, all of our stuff, if it's all up there, nobody wants to see that. But the beauty is, is God sees it and he knows it and he loves us still. And he's forgiven us in totality. And what's beautiful here is it says, 
Death and Hades gave up their dead. It says the sea gave up their dead. I'm going to table that for another time. If you want to, to conjecture with me about that, why does the sea have dead in it? It's fascinating. I just leave that there for, you for later. Search your Bibles. But what's amazing is, is really what's going on here at the great white throne is judgment happens. Jesus is the key and death is defeated. Because really death and Hades, they're cast in the lake of fire. This is the second death. But anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the, the lake of fire. And my friends, as I bring this message to a close and the last two chapters of Revelation are, are special because we see how God restores all these things and it's gonna be really beautiful. I want to encourage you to read ahead over the next couple messages. But here's the deal. Jesus is offering eternal life, fellowship with God to anybody who's willing to come and put their faith and trust in Jesus and follow him. The only reason someone will not receive the grace of God is because they are unwilling to receive it. I don't know about you. I go somewhere and they're like, hey, you want a free appetizer? Absolutely. If I came over and hey, Pastor Daniel, I got you a gift. I'm like, yeah, I don't want that. Like the fact that someone would think about me and say, hey, like, I, I, I want to bless you with this, right? I've never seen a kid on Christmas morning. I don't want that present with my name on it. But only grown people, when God says, I want to be your father. I want you to be my child. For some reason, we're like, yeah, I, I don't want that. And I'm here to tell you, you should want it. And Jesus is offering you forgiveness for the big things, the small things, for the shameful things, for the horrendous things, for the subtle things that weren't incredibly horrible, but they were still slightly imperfect. He's like, I came and lived perfectly before my father and I took your punishment on the cross. I was forsaken by my father on the cross so that you'd never have to. You never have to experience that. And there's an old saying that if you're born once, you'll die twice. But if you're born twice, you die once. If you're born physically, then you'll die a physical death and then ultimately you'll die a spiritual death, which we were reading about. But if you're born twice, physically born and then born again in your faith in Jesus, you'll die just once, a physical death, but never a spiritual death. And if you're here today and you're already a follower of Jesus, rejoice in your first and your second birth. Trust in your Savior and be strong in your faith because he who's in you is greater than he who's in the world. And if you are here today and you are not yet a follower of Jesus, today is the day to be born again by his Spirit so that you will never, ever have to experience the second death. Let's bow our heads and our hearts as we pray together. Father, thank you for Jesus. Thank you that Jesus is the key. He's the answer. Lord, we admit, Lord, in the book that tells of our works, it is a mess for each one of us. Lord, not that we're all as bad as we could be, just none of us are as good as we should be. We know what to do. We know what's right. We don't do it. We, we don't feel like doing it. We get grumpy and angry and frustrated and we, and we throw temper tantrums. We do all these things, Lord. And you see us and Lord, and you know us and you knew unless you sent your son on a rescue mission for us, we would be lost. We'd all be in that lake of fire with brimstone for eternity, rightfully so. But you sent Jesus and Lord, here at Crossroads today, we believe in Jesus. We have no, we confess them with our mouth. We believe in our heart. We follow Jesus. And we are grateful that we could be born again, that we could be blessed and holier, those who get to take part in the first resurrection, that we get to be people who don't have to experience the second death. And God, we want the whole world to know that we have been with Jesus by who we are, by how we live, by how we love, by how we walk.